Today we're gonna talk about some of the lessons we have learned over the years building streaming systems and batch systems at Google. So a little bit of history. This is a very, very condensed history slide of some of, of streaming processing at Google. Back in the, Google has been building streaming systems since the fairly early days of Google. Um, um, back in the early days, you, it would be things like streaming systems to calculate ad spend. If you were an AdSense customer, you could log into the AdSense front end website and see usually up to the minute reports on how your ads were doing. There would be, there would be, there would be streaming systems for handling indexing, quick indexing of websites for scoring to decide how important a website or how good an ad was. But for many years, these were mostly bespoke streaming systems. These different teams would have a problem, and they would sit down and design a streaming system to solve their specific problem. And from the early days, um, the systems were usually had to scale very high. Google had a lot of data coming through it. In many cases, exactly once was important. Uh, systems calculating uh, ad spend, calculating how much money was spent or earned definitely had to be exactly once. Teams would often build semi-generic streaming systems, so they would, they would build a, a substrate uh, for streaming that could be used for some other streaming problems, but usually only for other streaming problems that look more or less like the ones that team had built. Around 2008, uh, Google started, or 2007, 2008, Google started working on a system called Millwheel, which was a, meant to be a generic streaming system so that can be used to write these, uh, these stream pipelines uh, without the need to keep going back and writing bespoke systems. Um, there was also a system called Flume, which was a, uh, processing, a uh, high-level pipeline processing system. And then over the years, several papers were published. So in, yeah, a paper was published on Flume, a paper was published on Millwheel, and then in 2014, Google launched a data flow and published a paper on it in 2015. And over these years, we've learned a lot of lessons, many of them due to false starts because of things we, the things we did that did not work very well. So one of the lessons we really we learned, which should be very familiar to people who have used Flink in any extensive way, is watermarks. So what is a watermark? As some of you already know, a watermark is, it's just a way of tracking time. A watermark says that we think we've processed all data up until this point. So if a watermark is 12 o'clock, then that, that watermark is saying that I believe that all records that have an event timestamp, a timestamp embedded in the record earlier than 12 o'clock have already been processed. So for instance, if you're windowing and doing window aggregations, any windows that finish earlier than 12 o'clock, you can now close and process because we think we're pretty, we're pretty much done with these windows. So watermarks were talked about in the Millwheel paper. Uh, that was published at VLDB, I believe, 2013. Watermarks were in incorporated into Flink, incorporated into Dataflow, incorporated into Apache Beam. We originally came up, so came up with watermarks, though. Oh, so to back off a little bit, I mean, this is um, one of the reasons you need things like watermarks is this question of when you trigger output. So for a batch pipeline, the batch query itself triggers the output. So if you think of a classic SQL data warehouse, the SQL statement arriving or finishing oh, is the thing that queries output uh, 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 from your database. For a MapReduce or a class, any classic batch job, submitting the batch job is what triggers, hey, run this thing and come out with output. And for streaming, you have, you have to figure out when output can come. The job is submitted once and then it keeps running. The input data never ends, so you, you need to answer this question of when do you emit output from your pipeline. So one of the very first uh, users of this Millwheel system, way back in 2008, 
was a, a team that needed to compute anom anomalies over a very high cardinality uh, feature set. So imagine, for instance, every unique Google search query being a feature. And you, wanted to fi you want to find out whether there is an anomaly, an uh, unexpected spike or dip happening in any search. So they built this using Millwheel. And what they did is for every key, they built a cubic spline model, which would look something like this, which modeled just what the, the, the volume, the search volume for these keys looked like over the course of seconds, minutes, hours, and weeks. Um, and then, once you had these models, whenever uh, data came in for a key, you would compute a hist uh, the recent histogram of the last few seconds of data for the key, and they ran through a bunch of statistical models to compare it against these cubic splines to determine whether this was an anomalous uh, uh, set of data or not. And then this was used for various things. One use of it was for to drive Google News. So if there was an anomaly in some search query, then Google News would be notified, hey, start looking quickly for news articles for this topic. There might be something going on. And you know, there are many cases where we were able to track this working. For instance, when there was a major earthquake in Japan, um, it, within seconds of the earthquake, the system detected the anomaly and was telling Google News to index news articles. Unfortunately, it took about 15 minutes for anybody to write a news article. So in that case, the system was about 15 minutes faster than it needed to be. But the, the fundamental problem here is that once you have calculated this cubic spline, it, you can't modify it easily. It's there, if you calculate a cubic spline for you know, this you know, time interval, and then suddenly more data comes along for that time interval that you didn't expect, it's very difficult, at least we, our math wasn't good enough to figure out how do we modify this cubic spline to incorporate new, the new data. The only thing we knew how to do was throw away the entire calculation we had done, take all of the data again, and recalculate it, which is, of course, would be extremely expensive if we had to keep doing this over and over again as data kept showing up. So our first attempt, we knew that we couldn't just keep you know, doing sort of a materialized view, keep you know, every second recalculating this cubic spline as more data came up. That was prohibitively expensive. So the first attempt, for every key, we tracked the latest timestamp we've seen for the key. And we had some pr delta parameter. And we did some research to figure out what the average delay, delay was for data coming in. And let's say that we found out that over the course of the day, the maximum delay we saw was 10 minutes. Th these are fake numbers, and aren't the exact numbers we used back then. And I honestly don't remember the exact numbers we used back then. Um, and then for every key, this you know, latest timestamp minus delta was effectively our watermark for the key. Once we passed that, we would calculate the cubic spine and throw away our input data, because you say we're done. And if anybody's used uh, Spark Structured Streaming, this is still the technique that Spark is using and the technique that um, uh, Kafka K-Streams is using in their more recent uh, watermarks that they have launched. Unfortunately, it didn't really work very well. And there are two things that went wrong. The first thing it was it ended up being way too, way too fast. So very often, despite the fact that we had analyzed all this data and came up with this delta parameter, often a lot of data would show up that was still behind this watermark. And it wouldn't be evenly spread across your entire input space. It would be focused on you know, specific search queries that had specific patterns that often ended up being important ones. And so when you looked at the graphs, you know, there would be these huge dropouts on the graph. But then the other problem is it's too slow. So this, when you do this, you are delaying your output by 10 minutes all day because a few times a day the output might be delayed all day. So it's very wasteful. Most of the day, you don't need to wait 10 minutes, but because you think sometimes you might need to wait 10 minutes, you're always waiting 10 minutes for your output. It wasn't really a great way to do a, a low latency streaming system. 
So we kept, for a while, we actually kept going down this path and trying fancier and fancier techniques. For instance, instead of making delta be this constant, we built, we experimented with a lot of dynamic statistical models where we can keep track of, you know, dynamically based off of recent data, how things are looking and grow and shrink this delta to make it work better. None of them, were, none of them worked very well. Part of the problem is in these in these streaming systems, especially when your data is coming globally, your input is just too noisy to really learn a statistical model. And the delays are extremely unpredictable. The delay might be some server somewhere crashing, and a huge chunk of data gets delayed while that server restarts and resends it. Well, no statist the statistical models were just not able to predict this, they take too long to converge. By the time the models converge, you've already dropped a bunch of data. It didn't work out very well. So what we ended up doing is the trailing edge watermark, which is the one that ended up in the Millwall paper and the one that has ended up in other systems such as Flink and, and Dataflow and Beam, which is build a system that always tracks the oldest. And so instead of starting with the newest timestamp we've seen, track the oldest timestamp you've seen. So internal to the system, you can track this um, completely. External to the system, you can estimate it. Often if your data is coming in um, from a high volume source that's, that ha that's sourced from many places, um, even, the, even the estimates tend to be pretty good. And this is what we've used ever since, and this has worked fairly well. So the next lesson we've learned. So this, this talk is going to, is a bit of a grab bag of different lessons we've learned over the years. Oh, and this is, sorry, I'm not gonna go into this slide. This is a bit of a mathy formal definition of, uh, if you want to come up with a more formal definition of a watermark, anybody mathematically inclined is welcome to look at this on their own afterwards. I'm not gonna go into much detail on this slide. So the next lesson we learned is about adapting to changes in load and it changes in pipelines. So most streaming pipelines are processing real-time data, and this data, the amount of data is constantly changing. So if you look at this graph, for instance, this is a graph from a real streaming pipeline. You see, unsurprisingly, over the course of the day, the, your your input data varies sinusoidally, more, in the, more during the day, less at night. Over the course of a week, though, it also varies. So the amount of data you get on a Sunday is different than the amount of data you get on a Friday. The other thing you'll see is it's not completely smooth. Even in the middle of the day, you'll have these, you know, sudden spikes where a whole bunch of data comes in. Why? All sorts of reasons. Sometimes it's these noises I was talking about before where some front-end servers crash and then suddenly come back up five minutes later and dump a whole bunch of data. There are a host of reasons, but during the day, you, uh, you, you generally find these little spikes come in at unexpected times. So the lesson we've learned um, painfully is that trying to tell users to handle this via hand-tuning their pipelines um, can be very painful. First of all, hand-tuning these streaming pipelines is very hard. Um, it's sometimes it's a lot of black magic what parameters you have to set to tune them. These tuning once you've hand-tuned it, your tuning parameters tend to go stale. You know, I hand-tuned it in January by October, um, my company has grown, the input load is completely changed, my hand tuning is stale, and I have to go through this exercise again. And often, periodically, periodically you have to retune, and you tend not to figure out you have to do that until things have really deteriorated, and then you go look again and, and, and tune your pipeline again. One thing that was problematic for us because we were a services team, we built Millwheel and then gave it to other teams at Google to use, was that when people did hand tune their pipeline, it became a cargo cult science. 
So if people aren't familiar with the term cargo cult science, it comes from, it's a World War II term when there are islands in the Pacific that the US uh, airplanes used to use to refuel, and they would come and bring all sorts of supplies and food would come. And when the war ended, the planes left and stopped coming. And there are people on these islands that were trying to get these planes to come back, and it turned into a religion where they would build the things they saw, they would build fake landing strips and fake you know, flags and fake lights because those were the things they saw that triggered, that triggered the planes coming, and it became a, little, it became a religion for a while um, trying to get these planes to come back. So it became a cargo cult, we would find it become a cargo cult science. People would write flat tuning flags that worked well for this pipeline that they had used, and then they would save this file. And then the next, when they went to another team or if they built a new streaming pipeline, they would you know, copy that file over and just try those flags that had worked for them before. This is a problem with our batch pipelines as well. And there were many escalations where people said their streaming or batch pipelines weren't working. And we fixed it by asking them to, to delete all the flags they had on their pipeline and that fixed it. It's because they had copied flags from another pipeline because that's what worked before. And then if we, the other problem is you have to tune for the worst case. If you go back to this load variance, um, if you just simply tune, you're tuning to make sure that you can handle the peak of this graph. Um, you might even be tuning a little bit more because if your pi streaming pipeline ever falls behind, you have to catch up. So to catch up, you have to be able to process data faster than it's showing up. Um, and so this ended up being extremely wasteful. Um, most of the time, your pipeline was underutilized because you threw enough resources at it to make it handle the peak, but most of the time, you're not, you're not at the peak. So what did we do? We did many things to make our systems automatically handle this load variance. Um, I'm just going to mention a few of them that worked well. And one is batching. So what we found is when you're designing the systems, the programming model you give to users of the system, to users of Beam or to users of Flink, may logically be one element at a time. Internally, you should always process things in batches. And you should allow these batches sizes to be dynamic. And so when your pipeline is caught up and you're processing data as fast as it's coming in, you might look and notice that these batch sizes are very small because they don't need to be large. If your pipeline is falling behind, maybe there's a sudden spike of data you're trying to turn through, then these batches will dynamically grow and become larger and give you more efficiency, the efficiency you need to catch up. Uh, we also learned that you have to be very careful about putting arbitrary limits on batch sizes, especially time limits. We had many problems because we would try things like say, a batch should never contain timestamps larger than a certain range. A batch should never contain data for, for more than one window. And every time we do that, it would cause problems. Um, sometimes the problems would be because, you know, it worked well for one pipeline, and the next pipeline, the event time density of, pi of the pipeline, the number of event time seconds per actual second, uh, would change. And then these, these ended up being another set of hard-coded limits that we had to tune. So usually we would put limits on batches that were bite size or element outlet limits, which were necessary to keep from crashing with memory problems, but we, we found that we had to avoid limits based off of other things such as time. So another thing that was critical and that took a long time to get right, um, and arguably it's something that we still keep tweaking and tuning to this day, um, 11 years later, is, is a back pressure system or flow control in your pipeline. So you need to, flow control is necessary to prevent workers from getting overloaded and crashing. Um, a flow control system that is adaptive will help you change to, uh, to, to adapt to changing load. So when these sudden spikes come in, you can handle it. You don't suddenly have everything crashing because you've hand-tuned everything to handle a certain, a certain amount of input, right? And 
It also reduces the need. It's another adaptive system that reduces the need to perfectly tune the cluster, a hand, perfectly hand tune the cluster. It's something that, in a, it's another auto tuning system that helps the cluster work efficiently um, based off of what the, the, what the load is. So what are the sorts of things that you're flow controlling? You, we found that usually you're trying to control two types of resources, soft resources and hard resources. So, so a soft resource is usually a resource that if you run out of it, your system behave, uh, degrades gracefully, or at least somewhat gracefully. So an example is CPU. When you run out of CPU, your system, you know, your system gets slower, it can't keep up, you know, your thread start, your thread switches start taking a long time, everything you do starts becoming slow, but usually your processes don't start crashing. Usually, sometimes running out of CPU tends to expose a lot of other bugs in your system that causes your system to not degrade gracefully. Hard resources are things like memory. When you run out of memory, then your memory allocations just start failing or start throwing exceptions on you, and that's when processes start, cr start crashing. So, C so for CPU, you want to try to keep your CPU resources down. For, memory, for hard resources such as memory, you want to absolutely prevent your processes from running out of memory, because then your processes start crashing, and that's when a system starts going into a tailspin. When so, many signals we found useful. Um, Q length is one, especially the growth of Q length. So Q length is records are coming in and queuing up to be processed and faster than we can process them, then those input queues will start growing. That's a sign that you're, you're sending records faster than this, uh, than this worker can process. Might be because you're out of CPU, it might be because the worker has some other bottleneck, maybe lock contention. And then memory usage is another signal we use. And eventually, if things are really overloaded, you know, flow control will back all the way up and your system will stop pulling from your source. It'll stop pulling from Kafka or, you know, whatever else your source is. But I mentioned that getting this right was hard. And there are many reasons it was hard. But one reason is because if you're not careful, flow control can deadlock your entire system. So imagine a case in which you're flow controlling because of memory. I have these three workers. Each worker is you know, handling a, a portion of this topology. Every worker has now decided, hey, I'm, I'm out of memory. I'm not going to accept deliveries from other workers now. But then every worker is also holding on to memory because it has pending deliveries to other workers. Now every worker is waiting on every other worker. Your system is stuck. It's, just, it's not going to recover. Um, so. This is something that early versions of our flow control would occasionally uh, suffer from. There were solving this in general. You know, we had many iterations where we did things that made this increasingly less likely. So it rarely happened, but then it would still happen occasionally. So fundamentally, if you're flow controlling based off of memory, in order to avoid deadlock, workers must be able to release memory. And so this was one of our, you know, one of the big design points of the more recent streaming systems that Google has had. Um, so there are many ways you can do that. Um, it might involve canceling in-flight work to retry it later. Um, that itself tends not to be enough because you can run into problems where you oscillate in and out of flow. You can run into live lock problems where everybody flow controls, you're deadlocked, all the workers cancel a chunk of work and release memory, and then all that work retries, and you end up in flow control again. And so instead of deadlock, you end up in live lock. Um, the other thing we did with data flow was to make sure that um, whenever workers have, pend have pending data, we can always spill it to disk. So if worker one has pending data going to worker three, and we are in this deadlock situation, worker one is completely flow controlled, it can spill some of that pending data to disk, evict it from memory, and then s sequentially scan it back in, uh, from disk into memory as, you know, as I free up some of my other memory by, by successfully delivering messages. <laughs> 
So this is one of the main things that made Dataflow completely resistant to these deadlock situations where previous systems didn't. When you end up with a situation where everybody's flow controlled, performance slows down because you start writing a lot more data to disk and scanning it back, but performance never completely comes to a halt. And finally, auto scaling. So going back to that original graph I showed, and I remember I said that if people would tend to provision their clusters for the peak, for the maximum amount of data they would see. And so we put a lot of effort into building an, auto, an adaptive auto scaling system that allows us to uh, uh, dynamically uh, change the number of workers in your cluster uh, f uh, based off of the input data, the input volume for, the, for that pipeline at that time. Now for auto scaling to work, you also need uh, dynamic load balancing. So if, you're, if, you have a, if you have a pipeline running on say 100 workers and a spike comes and you add 20 more workers, in order to take advantage of those workers, um, since uh, the streaming stateful systems tend to be statefully load balanced, you have to be able to move some work off of those 100 workers onto those 20 workers. Sometimes that, and sometimes that might involve splitting work that you have on those existing workers. So to make that work, um, we, had, we had to do a lot of very fundamental uh, design points in the underlying system. So for instance, in Dataflow, the underlying system never assumes fixed workers never assumes you're talking to worker two or worker 23 uh, because the work ownership can be moved at any time. So under the covers, the way it actually works uh, is that all the keys are hash sharded. There is a load balancer that assigns hash, uh, ra hash ranges to the workers. And whenever a worker needs to talk, needs to shuffle data, rather than logically sending data to another worker, it's modeled as sending an RPC to data. You're sending an RPC to a key. And then there's an indirection layer that always figures out, oh, this key is currently on this worker. We'll send, this, uh, we'll send, the, uh, we'll send the data to that worker. Of course, you still can't assume anything about that worker because if something fails and you retry, you might retry and by then the worker you're sending to has changed and now you have to send uh, the work to a different worker. So, I can't, it's, that has added a whole lot of complexity to the system. So things like exactly once protocols uh, to make, uh, become much more complex when you have to assume that things are continuously dynamically load balanced. For instance, um, if you can assume fixed workers, you can often rely on things like TCP ordering semantics and build stuff on top of that. If you assume that the, that the machine you're talking to might change at a moment's notice without and it, uh, you know, between you know, sending a message and retrying that message, suddenly you can't make any of those assumptions. So it forced us to build much more intricate protocols, uh, which was the price we had to pay for building a dynamic system that could dynamically scale and load balance. And finally, we, have to se we had to separate storage from compute, which is something that Sergey is gonna talk about a lot more. So final lessons here. We found that for Dataflow um, and for previous systems such as Millwheel, keeping things dynamic is key. No amount of static configuration ever helps because eventually the universe outsmarts you. No matter what you come up, static configuration you come up with for a pipeline, eventually the world is gonna throw some set of data, some configuration that's gonna outsmart it. And therefore we, re we always focused on having dynamic configuration. And now I'll hand it over to Sergey, who's going to talk about separating storage from compute. Thanks, Ruben. After working multiple years on the product, I finally understood some finer points. Um, hope it was informative for you as well. Fun fact about all three speakers uh, today in the keynotes, uh, we all come from Seattle. So if tomorrow rains, you can blame it on us. Or yesterday. Or yesterday. Well, depends on when the whole arrived. So I'll be talking about separating uh, compute from state storage and how it improves uh, scalability of your streaming and also batch pipelines. 
I thought of starting perhaps with the introduction of different steaming processing options in GCP. It will make, uh, make sense shortly why I'm bringing this up. Uh, typically when you build steaming processing in the Google Cloud, uh, you, you're using products such as Cloud PubSub for ingestion and distributing your uh, messaging uh, messages. Then you use uh, Dataflow, Cloud Dataflow in streaming mode for aggregations, time-based analysis, enrichment, and detecting patterns. And once you're ready uh, to deposit your enriched and pre-aggregated data into some sort of a data warehouse or use machine learning tools, you're using things like BigQuery, Bigtable, as well as Cloud AI Platform. Now, there's always a little bit of batch in every steam, uh, steaming system. Uh, so Dataflow provides uh, batch processing capabilities pretty much with the same API as our uh, steaming, um, steaming mode. Uh, if you would like to follow the ELT pattern, extract, load, and then transform in the data warehouse, uh, BigQuery offers a steaming ingestion point, uh, and then you, once you get your steaming data and landed your steaming data in BigQuery, you can run uh, SQL-based analysis on it. When we went ahead and, uh, and designed this, uh, this new concept and, and uh, designed the new system that separates state storage from compute, the motivational uh, example that uh, kind of initiated this work was some of our larger customers migrating to the Google Cloud, migrating from Hadoop clusters, such as Spotify, for example, who, uh, who moved their largest uh, uh, European Hadoop cluster to uh, not entirely to Dataflow, but they rewrote all of the pipelines that used to run on that large cluster to now run on Dataflow. Uh, today, it was a successful migration. Today, they're running hundreds of thousands of uh, Dataflow jobs per month. The stats here on the slide uh, are slightly dated, so it's now more than, uh, more than the numbers you're seeing. And there's approximately a 90, 10% split, 90% batch, 10% uh, steaming in terms of jobs, which makes sense because steaming Pipelines are always on, they always run, while uh, batch pipelines are recurring, uh, you run a few uh, per day, maybe once a day, once an hour. Uh, Spotify is now using data for everything, everything. Uh, music recommendations, uh, ads, uh, behavioral analysis, uh, business metrics, and some of their larger batch jobs uh, are going into tens of thousands of CPUs and uh, uh, hundreds of terabytes of data. So to serve such large customers, we had to really rethink the traditional data processing architecture. In the traditional data processing architecture, you have a cluster of uh, processing nodes, workers. Uh, they're typically virtual machines that run your uh, pipeline code. Uh, and uh, these VMs have uh, network-attached storage. Um, so it represents a disk or multiple disks that the CPU uh, can access and do processing on. Uh, all of the VMs are communicating through a fast network, and there's some sort of a control plane, maybe a few nodes that represent the control plane that manage all, all of the data plane uh, uh, virtual, virtual machines. So the traditional architecture works really well when your data flow or your graph of the pipeline uh, is easily parallelizable. But um, there are some, some interesting challenges once you get into bringing the data together uh, data that is located on different worker nodes for joining and grouping. Uh, some of you might, uh, might kind of know what the issue with Shuffle is. Shuffle is a central technology that's necessary for grouping and joins. Uh, typically in Shuffle, what you're trying to do, you start with uh, a distributed uh, a set of, uh, of nodes. You have data uh, divided into, into bits and located on different uh, workers. And so when you want to do grouping or joins, uh, you need to physically move key value pairs on, uh, on individual nodes and uh, assign ownership for particular keys. Um, you end up doing this shuffling operation, and at the end, you have a sorted list of uh, key value pairs where a particular uh, worker VM is responsible for a range of keys. So it's very standard. Everyone is using it. But in the traditional architectures, uh, things get can very uh, hairy once, uh, once, you, uh, once your data sets move into dozens of terabytes, maybe hundreds of terabytes, or, or in uh, petabytes. Uh, you can still do it, 
but it requires a lot of manual uh, manual tuning, and you, you really need to know what you're doing to, to achieve uh, good results. So because of that, we've, uh, we've developed uh, a technology that uses a distributed in-memory shuffling, uh, shuffling service for our batch pipelines. Uh, we are, you continue running your user code on a compute cluster, but that cluster doesn't really have any storage attached to it. Maybe just a few disks with very small, uh, small volumes, um, uh, just to keep the, the boot image um, uh, available. But all of the state of your batch pipeline is actually managed by a, uh, by a service. Uh, we call it Shuffle. And this service, uh, in our case, is uh, uh, internal uh, joke here. Uh, we call it MindMeld, uh, MindMeld service from the Star, uh, uh, Star Trek days. Um, um, so we use this technology we call MindMeld, and it's actually used both in BigQuery and Dataflow. Uh, what does this service do? Well, in every region that GCP is present, we have a deployment uh, of the service, uh, and the service is uh, providing a proxy to receive requests to shuffle data, but then once it receives a request, it uses a distributed uh, hybrid uh, file system that uh, most of the time is actually doing the shuffling in memory. Uh, in those cases where the data sets are very large and we cannot use memory, uh, we do offload the data to, to disks and do the shuffling on disks. To the user, to the user code, the pipeline code that runs on your compute cluster, uh, you're actually not exposed to any of this. You are completely ignorant that there is a distributed service running somewhere, what it does, how it works. You just submit requests to shuffle data, you get responses, you're, you're happy. Uh, you also don't have to change any pipeline uh, code or, or yeah, any pipeline code. The, the way you start using this distributed shuffle is by using a uh, pipeline setting. So the results of this uh, switch from uh, the traditional architecture to, uh, to a service uh, created uh, improvements in performance. Now your pipelines are running faster. Uh, here are a couple of real results, um, uh, starting with a non-tuned worker-based shuffle uh, taking maybe up to an hour to, to process a particular data set, going down all the way to maybe a 10-minute ten, ten time period for, uh, for a, a shuffle uh, job that, uh, that runs on the service. Uh, another benefit of this approach is uh, you're able to support larger data sets. We have customers who, who run shuffle jobs in hundreds of terabytes. Every, every couple of months we see an increase. So I think the largest one right now uh, was in uh, 400 or 500 terabytes. And, and the size is increasing uh, every year. Well, so far we've talked about batch processing. Uh, you might ask, well, does it all apply to steaming pipelines as well? And it turns out steaming pipelines also need to store state. There's also the, the need to, to do steaming shuffle. You do have your groupings and join, joins in steaming pipelines. But in addition to, uh, to the shuffle uh, uh, need, there's also the need to store windows, uh, window uh, time elements. And again, in traditional architectures, uh, you are storing them on your... Um, network attached uh, volumes uh, that kind of you end up reshuffling every time you, you auto scale. So this is a uh, chart we, we tend to show kind of explaining the differences between, between event time and processing time. I, I'm sure most of you understand the differences between event time and processing time. Uh, the key point I wanted to make here is all of the time windows that you, want, that you aggregate uh, until you can trigger uh, on them and do computations, they need to be stored somewhere. And we end up storing them on the, uh, on the network attached disks, which, which means there's a lot of data in streaming pipelines that needs to be saved, preserved, and uh, uh, all of the network communications that goes uh, across workers uh, can be quite daunting. Similarly to Batch, we released a, um, a service uh, for streaming pipelines. We call it the Steaming Engine. Uh, that provides a uh, interface for uh, Windows state storage and steaming shuffle. So all of the shuffling and, uh, and state storage now in Dataflow is actually done on, on a service that runs uh, at Google. Uh, and it provides benefits such as we can more easily support it because we can maintain the backend service much easier without touching your user code. Uh, we, less, uh, we use less worker resources 
all of the previous shuffling, all of the previous uh, Windows state storage uh, is actually moved to, to a different service. Now your pipeline suddenly have more resources. And it's more efficient in auto scaling. And I'm going to show you and prove it. Why is auto scaling better in a, in, a serve, in a setup where your state storage is separate from compute? Well, let's review this. So on the left hand side, I have a architecture with a steaming engine. So this is the new architecture where state storage is separate from compute. On the right hand side, I have uh, the traditional architecture um, that has, has state storage on the workers. When you scale up and down, your unit of scaling in this traditional architecture is really completely vertical. You have to scale state together with compute. In the steaming engine case, though, uh, you can scale compute separately from storage, which means if your pipeline is more compute intensive, you can launch more workers. If your pipeline is more state intensive, you can increase the resources for, uh, for the steaming engine. Here's actually a comparison of, uh, of two real data flow jobs that ran the same code. On the left hand side, you have the steaming engine version. On the right hand side, you have the uh, traditional uh, architecture. Again, this is the same code just ran with two different settings. Uh, let me walk you through what happened here. Uh, over a period of uh, about an hour or so, there was a large incoming uh, load into the pipeline which got processed by, uh, by both, work, uh, both uh, jobs. And then there was a period of uh, inactivity and after which there was another spike. So let's say it's a uh, kind of a recurring um, uh, steaming job that has a lot of inputs at the beginning and then several hours of inactivity. In this initial time period in the steaming engine pipeline, we had the following happening. So we scaled up to uh, First, about 100 workers, then we scaled up to 150. We actually didn't need all the way, uh, the maximum that we set for the pipelines. By the way, before the, for, uh, I need to explain, we set the maximum of uh, available resources to 150 workers. Um, in the traditional architecture, though, the pipeline decided to scale up all the way to 150 just because there was so much data that needed to be stored on, uh, on, the, on these disks. So it, um, uh, Dataflow decided we needed all of the resources uh, that we could grab to, to, to store that state. And over a period of time, uh, we processed the, the data in both cases. Um, the, the, uh, the ovals here represent the CPU utilization. As you can see, the CPU utilization on the streaming engine side was actually pretty high, uh, more than 80%. So uh, it was quite efficient. Uh, all of the data crunching was done very efficiently. In the other case, in the traditional architecture, CPU was, uh, was okay, about maybe 70%. Uh, not too high, not too low. Uh, but because of the state, we really couldn't downscale. Now, the steaming engine pipeline finished much, much faster. It downscaled much faster once the incoming load was processed. Uh, it went down all the way to, I think initially it went down to maybe five and then eventually to one while the traditional pipeline had multiple steps of downscaling because once it uh, was crunching through the data, it uh, was, was scaling down and then had to process a little bit more of data, it again had to scale down. So it ended up with this interesting uh, curve. Uh, ultimately for the user though, the left hand side, the, the left job is much more efficient from a resource usage point of view. Uh, you would be paying for the, uh, for the integral of all of the, uh, for the entire graph, right? So in the left-hand side case, you would have paid much less than in the right-hand side case, or you would use resources much less. Uh, one of our um, customers, AB Testy, they are a French, uh, French uh, marketing technology company. They do personalization and experimentation. They actually uh, are using this technology to a large scale. Um, their challenge was they wanted to have everything work out of the box. They didn't want to spend any time on tuning their pipelines. They've tried steaming processing in different environments. Uh, we weren't their first choice, but when they came to us and tried this out, they got convinced because it didn't require them to, to do any manual tuning. It just worked out of the box. Uh, 
They have pretty significant uh, data volumes. And, and now that they've tried the steaming engine, they're also trying uh, other different uh, uh, processing options we offer them. Batch processing, for example, with what we call FlexRS, which is a cost eff effective way to do uh, batch processing using preemptible VMs. So hopefully, just to conclude uh, our keynote, hopefully both uh, Ruben and I were able to uh, to share some some knowledge and some lessons learned with you. Uh, uh, learns with you. Uh, we saw how trailing edge watermarks uh, provided finally provided a solution for uh, for us to to determine when to trigger aggregations. We looked at um, what is really required to, to keep uh, the system elastic and, ad and adaptive to, to realize the best auto-scaling performance. And we also looked how separate state storage and compute was really beneficial for, uh, again, for uh, auto-scaling in both batch and streaming. Thank you very much for inviting us. I would be happy to take questions afterwards. Thank you.